sometimes things can go wrong in an unexpected way and solutions can still be found to keep the spacecraft working. So an example of this is the Kepler mission, which went up with the um, aim of looking for exoplanets around distant stars. Um, same issue with the gyroscopes, had mechanical spinning gyros just like Hubble and eventually came down to a, points of failure in which it, re it only had two that were left. At this point, it wasn't in Earth orbit like Hubble. It didn't have the magnetic torque or bars to act against the Earth's magnetic field. And so it was really um, not able to be pointed in the accuracy that it needed to be, with the precision that it, was, it needed to be to do its uh, mission. And so Carl went out to the community for good ideas on, on how to make this work. Someone came up with a real genius idea of using the photon pressure from the sun as, a, as, a, as the third stabilizer. So getting the spacecraft in an orientation in its orbit so that every part of it was feeling the same photon pressure from the sun. That's, that's the, the pressure from individual photons hitting um, the spacecraft. And that was enough. It, it didn't mean that you could point it anywhere you wanted anymore. You had to keep it in a really steady, safe, orientation, um, but that allowed them to extend the mission looking at one particular patch of sky throughout most of the orbit of the, the spacecraft around the sun. For me, the program that we had was a fairly large program. It was, we were awarded 80 orbits on the, the space telescope. How long is that in time? So one orbit is about 90 minutes, um, but a good fraction of that you're actually behind the Earth. And so that's when all the maneuverings done, any large scale maneuverings are done um, when you're passing behind the earth. Um, and then you've probably got, a, depending on where you're pointing, a window of about 50, uh, 55 minutes uh, to make your observations with. What were you looking at? So I was looking at that area of that poster back there, which is what I've spent much of my career looking at. And that is an image from a ground-based telescope um, with one camera, Pointing, covering an area about the size of the full moon, a really wide field camera. We then got time on Hubble to go back and make a panorama across that. And we calculated we'd need 80 images with the Hubble Space Telescope and we'd stitch them all together and then we'd cover that whole area with really, really high resolution imaging. Megan, during that 50 minutes that you have got Hubble for on the orbit, presumably the telescope is kind of moving or slewing so it's continually pointing at that one bit of the sky you want. That's where the gyroscopes come in and also the fine guidance sen sensors which are the final part of the, the really fine tuning of the pointing. And so once you get in the, the region of your target you provide it with uh, the locations of some guide stars and there's a special instrument on Hubble devoted to keeping those guide stars locked in place. Uh, and not letting them move at all out of the field of view. So in preparing for this video, um, I went back into my email archive of 10, 15, 10, 11 years ago, and I'd actually kind of forgotten the incredible headache and complicated nature of scheduling these observations and exactly what happened because, and I have the piece of paper here. Cool, I'm excited about this. Because instead of a nice symmetric up and down, north, south, east, west, lovely square mosaic, what we ended up with in the end was this rather jaggedy looking outline which is all 80 of our images stitched together. So this square represents the area of that poster and this jagged region represents the observations that we did with Hubble of that region all stitched together. Looks like you missed a few bits. Well, this was the complicated thing. So when, when we try to design the observations, so you don't just get time and then get to point the telescope wherever you like, you have to fill in very, very technical instructions on what you want your observations to be, when you want them to take place, if that's important, any other information that goes into the schedulers and they try their best to make that happen. So we said, right, we would like everything to be oriented in a nice square pattern, please. Um, but the complications that we had with respect to the pointing availability of the telescope with the Earth, with the solar panels, um, with um, the, the direction to the target meant that there's very limited amounts of time in which 
the telescope could be pointed with that orientation. Um, and so what I'd forgotten is that, in fact, there was another survey that was already ongoing, uh, the COSMOS survey, which is a huge, huge um, allocation of, of Hubble time. Um, and they are not too far away on the sky from where we wanted to point. And they basically locked up all the time that we call this the roll angle, the orientation that the, the, the telescope's pointing on the sky, basically locked all that up. And so they came back to us and said, sorry, uh, you can't have a mosaic that looks like that. We can offer you <laughs> this angle. And so then we had to rejig all of our observations and the, and the location of all those 80 tiles uh, to stitch together this, this rather um, less aesthetically pleasing, uh, but still scientifically absolutely fine um, mosaic that, that we've used since then. Is it a nervous time when it's your Hubble time, or have they got it down so slick now that when you've got Hubble time you know it's all going to work? Or for those like few days, are you like having restless nights thinking, oh, I hope the images are coming out right, I hope it doesn't break? Or are you pretty confident you're going to get what you want when you've got Hubble time? Uh, well, I mean, you can never be confident with, with things in space. Space is hard. Um, Hubble is a wonderful um, facility, but things have gone wrong. Instruments have failed. In fact, the fact that an instrument failed opened up the time that ended up being used for my program. So in, in a sense, you know, our scientific exploits were founded on the back of someone else's disappointment, which is really kind of sad. Um, but you can, th there's never a guarantee. And I haven't used it recently, but as I recall, I didn't know to the, to the hour or the minute or even the day uh, when the observations were going to take place. Things were being shifted around even at that very late notice. Um, so essentially it was just sort of cross your fingers, uh, wait for the emails, uh, and then hope, hope it all, all came through. In fact, um, what happened with us, uh, so we designed the program so that we started from the inside and we worked out in kind of a spiral in case something went wrong we'd still at least have the central regions covered. You can see some of these squares are marked in gray, and that's because for these ones at the edge, we didn't manage to fit them in before the window of observations closed. For the one in the middle, that observation failed because the guide stars didn't work out. So what happened is they came back six months later when the telescope was in a complete 180 degree or, uh, different orientation, and took the observations for us to complete that mosaic. But everything else was done by our request, very close together, all in one chunk. How do you get your data? Like, do you open an email one day and see like an amazing photo of stars, or is it more anticlimactic than that? How do you, when do you first see your results when you have Hubble time? You get an email that tells you you can go to the archive and, and, and find your, your data there. It's yours to do what you want with for 12 months, and then it gets opened up to the public to anybody who wants to access those files can register for an account and get them. I know a lot of manipulation are done to Hubble pictures to make them look like what I think Hubble pictures look like. When you first see your Hubble pictures as raw data, do they look spectacular or do they look, would I say they look boring? Well, I mean, one of the nice things about Hubble is that um, it, it has this wonderful pipeline that all of the instruments are so well known and so well calibrated that software has been written that will take you from the raw images to a fairly complete image, um, sort of automatically, so to speak. You can do it all again if you want, and many many people do to try to fine tune it for their own purposes. Um, but you can you can get a, a pretty good image out. It's not it's not the color image. It's not you know with all the nice uh, blues and greens and reds. Um, but but the, the black and white data does come out pretty cleaned up with all the noise removed. Doesn't mean that if you're looking for something really faint, you might be able to see it in a single frame, you might still need to be combining frames, that sort of thing. If and when James Webb Telescope gets up into space and starts doing the business, is that one that you're going to want to use? Um, yeah, sure. Everyone wants. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah. the, 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 the strengths of James Webb Telescope play into the sort of science you, you do? Well, no, that, actually that's, that's not quite the case. Um, a lot of what I do needs big numbers of, of objects and wide areas, and that's kind of the opposite of what James Webb does. It does, you know, small, small area of sky in, in very high resolution. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't think of something to do with it. <laughs>
reduces the amount of light and the wavelength of light. Otherwise, you would, you would fry your optics and you would fry your eye if you looked through a, an eyepiece at it. This camera over here is connected to this computer that does all the image acquisition. 